Hello everyone. Today I'm going to read Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. Written by Katherine Gibbs Davis and illustrated by Gilbert Ford. It was only 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, France's Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high that visitors to, to the top could go see Paris in one breathtaking sweep. Completed in 19, excuse me, 1889, the Eiffel Tower stood at 986 feet, surpassing America's Washington Monument to become the world's tallest man-made structure. Now it was America's turn to impress the world and at the 1893 Chicago World Fair. But what would outshine the famous French tower and who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Before TV and the internet, People from around the globe gathered at the World's Fair to share their different ways of life and new technologies. Tasty inventions such as the hamburgers and Cracker Jacks first appeared here. Contest drawings poured in from around the country, but most of the plans looked like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one. Was this really the best that American engineers could muster? To an ambitious young mechanical engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. had already designed some of the biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He would never allow a French tower to overshadow America's World's Fair. Why hadn't the United States built the world's first skyscraper? George had seen the elegant steel frame rise 10 stories high with his own eyes. And this says, supported by a metal frame instead of solid walls, Chicago's home insurance building was the world's first skyscraper. Bird cages were the inspiration for the metal frame. George had an idea, an idea for a structure that would dazzle, move, not just stand like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Grinnell measured and remeasured. A mistake even of an inch could bring their invention crashing down. George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief of the fair. The chief stared at George's drawings. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge and complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawings and said, you are an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something that the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. George was a steel expert and his structures would be made with a steel or of a steel alloy. Alloys combine a super strong mix of hard metal with two or more chemical elements. Judges could not decide. Fall turned into winter as they dilly-dallied. In only four months, the fair would open, and it still had no star attraction. 
Finally, desperate, they agreed to give George's far-fetched idea a try, but they would not give him one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank asking for help, but when he began describing his, event, his invention, lenders laughed him into the street. So George used his own savings and convinced a few wealthy investors to join him. Still, a short, still short of money, he boldly went ahead and ordered the parts he needed from a dozen different steel mills. In 19, sorry, in January 1893, George's construction crew began to work on the foundation. Shovels broke as the workers tried digging into the frozen ground. It was one of the most brutally cold winters in Chicago history. Blessed, George ordered his crew to dynamite the icy earth. But what they found underneath was scarier still, quicksand. The deadly muck could suck a man or machine under in seconds. The frost at the wheel site was three feet deep. The quicksand was 20 feet in depth and saturated with water, said Luther V. Rice, construction and operations manager. Pumps were kept running night and day to keep out the water and live stream had to be used to thaw the sand and broken stone. George and his brave workers kept frantically digging. Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They planked two huge steel towers deep into the earth and bolted them to crossbars of steel and poured in the cement to hold it all in place. Then they lowered a 70-ton axle with fittings the weight of a Mongol locomotive train between them. This sturdy structure would hold the gigantic invention steady in even the strongest Chicago winds. At 45 feet long, the axle, a metal rod, was the largest piece of steel ever forged, and a boy helped to hammer it into shape at the Bethlehem Ironworks. As time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged onto the fairgrounds, loaded with more than 100,000 parts. Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego toy. Hammers pounded nonstop in the breathless race to finish. Responsible for the wheel's many structural details, George's partners were losing hope. It's undignified. Stand back, dear. It might collapse. Bet you the wind will blow Ferris's follies into the lake. Nope, it'll fall first. It's going up way too fast. They say Ferris's wheel is all in his head. Frequently, I was discouraged and ready to give up. But through the encouragement of Mr. Ferris... Work always resumed. Will Gnau. Finally, with only two months left after the last section was bolted into place, there stood a perfect, enormous circle, 834 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground and designed to move with pre precision of the smallest watch. It looked exactly how George first imagined it back as a boy on his ranch in Nevada. Living near the shore of Nevada's Carson River, George had often watched the water wheel turn round and round. Many times he had imagined shrinking to the size of one of his toy soldiers and hitching a ride up, up, up and away in one of its wooden buckets. Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin, 
and George's elegant passenger car still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a living room with enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. George's wheel worked like a bicycle wheel. Both were supported by a skinny, flexible rods called spokes. As the wheel turned, the spokes worked together to share the weight. These are called tension wheels. On June 21st, 1893, opening day finally arrived. 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and dedicated his wheel to the noble profession of engineering. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their nervous but excited guests. Uniformed guards closed and locked the door. Would the wheel work? George blew the golden whistle. 2,000 tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine. Up, 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 the car quietly floated above the mud and noise. Two steam engines, and an extra one in case one broke, made the wheel turn. George had hidden them under the wooden platform where the riders boarded. As the car was lifted higher, everyone rose from their velvet seats and, the, and crowded to the window. Spread out below them was a dizzying sweep of fairgrounds, the city of Chicago, and sparkling Lake Michigan, and even glimpses of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, the powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whispering soft stop. When the conductor called all out, everyone begged to go around again. The wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the city of Chicago, and across the country. All summer, visitors from around the world traveled to Chicago's World's Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy, or a girl. Everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couple asked to get married on it. On hot, steamy days, the wheel was the perfect place to escape. Up, up, up into the cooling breeze. All you needed was 50 cents. During the 19 weeks the wheel was in operation, 1.5 million passengers rode it. It revolved more than, revolved more than 10,000 times and withstood gale force winds and storms and did not even need one repair. At night, George's Ferris wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs, another brand new invention. As the queen of the midway made its stately rotation, so did the seasons. Soon, a fall chill filled the air and fair visitors began to thin out. In the late 1800s, homes were still lit with candles and kerosene lamps. The Chicago's World Fair helped reassure people that electricity was safe. At night, farmers and sailors from as far away as 40 miles could see the wheel's spectacular blades of light. On October 26, 1893, just before midnight, an immense twinkling spinning circle slowed to its final stop. The Chicago World Fair was over. George had called his creation a monster wheel, but his inventors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. 
the Chicago Fair or the White City inspired two more magical places. The Emerald City, which is in the classic children's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and Disneyland. Well, Disney's father was a construction worker on the fair. He told his son stories about the dreamlike city he had helped build. And young Walt grew up to build the famous amusement park that stay open all year around. Visitors return to their homes to tell the story of the world's greatest ride. And before long, copies of the Ferris wheel began popping up around the world. In 1894, the next Ferris wheel appeared in California on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It lit up at night and it was the first landmark seen by ships on their way home. See it way up there? Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on one still feels like flying to the moon and ooh, 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 the view. Since 1893, there have been over eight tallest ever Ferris wheels and the race continues. The current record holder for the world's tallest is in Sing Singapore and it is at 541 feet. And that's the end. So now you know how the Ferris wheel was invented.